Yeah, of course, but like it just looks like you touched pretty much every yeah. thought that there ever like you you covered the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, finally. Streaming software was that being unruly. Okay, everyone, let's not delay further. Um, let me better. Some people are already opting to go outside and follow online because it's uh, quite intense in here. But yes, um, I think we, yes, we're all ready to go. I think we can hear you. And yeah, when are you ready? Sounds good. And the slides, they're also in Discord. And this particular talk has been given in a number of locations. And so there's yeah plenty of other places to get this if people are feeling too hot. Um, the title is Categorical Databases, although in retrospect, given the theme of the day, I probably should have called it like what happens when you redesign database theory while on psychedelics, um, because the talk describes a new way to do database theory that um, it has been in the literature for a few decades, but really kind of came into the forefront again about 10 years ago um, in a group around David Spivak at MIT. So. Anyway, why would you want to do databases using category theory as opposed to, you know, the way they are now with relational database theory and all these other things? And well, as people have heard during the sessions at the summer school, category theory was designed to migrate theorems from one area of math to another, like take a theorem from uh, algebra and move it into topology. And so, you know, if we think of databases as little knowledge structures, then it seems you know, very natural that we might use category theory um, to move data from one schema to another. And so that's what this talk is about, like a new mathematical way to do that. Um, and there's a open source tool that implements all this in software. You can go to categoricaldata.net um, mm -hmm. that also has a list of like all of our published papers and, and that kind of thing. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, yeah, today I will basically like talk about how to do this mathematically, show the tool a little bit if there's time. And then as an added bonus for the people who were looking at type theory the other day, I'll talk about how there's another model of the lambda calculus um, in databases rather than in programs, which is, you know, not something that people tend to think about. So kind of a cool um, mathematical coincidence. Anyway, any questions before we get started? All right. So um, a little bit of background before going into the uh, mathematical details, just to like show that this isn't all just papers and, and fluff. So the, the open source tool, um, it's been deployed in a number of different projects. So the National Institutes of Standard and Technology here, the military, uh, we've used it with quantum chemists over at Stanford. We helped um, Uber with some of their graph database problems using a, a tech called Tinkerpop that this is related to and you know deployed this at oil companies and, and finance companies. And so you know, this mathematical model, um, like you know, it's not just in theory, it, it exists in practice and um, sort of give a, a for showing of what the, the value prop is, is that you can move data much more rigorously and formally with this methodology um, using techniques like automated theorem improving and such that don't really exist um, in the relational side. So anyway, with that in mind, um, let's briefly review category theory and I'll only spend a minute on this because I think most people know this. So, um, and also this is about as much category theory as we'll need to understand this. So one of the neat things about defining databases with category theory is like how little stuff you need besides the basics of category theory to make it happen. Um, so anyway, what's a category? Um, category C, you got a set of objects, ob C, uh, for every two objects, X and Y, there's a set of morphisms between them. That set has to have an identity morphism. And then um, there's a composition operation that stitches together morphisms, um, you know, the same domain and codomain that needs to be associative and the identity morphism needs to be its unit. Um, and there's many categories that we know and love and of special import in this talk is the category set it has sets as objects and functions of arrows. Um, other people might be familiar with categories. I put that in quotes because it's not really a category unless you squint the category Haskell, like a functional programming language, like a Lambda calculus. Um, that has types as objects and programs as arrows. Um, and then I'll say what a functor is and then pause for questions. So a functor is just a morphism of categories. 
it's a function taking objects of one objects of another. So say our functor goes from category C to category D. We have a function on objects. We have a function on arrows. And that function on arrows has to respect identities and composition. And so um, anyway, there's a functor on the category of sets, takes it back to itself, sends each set to its power set. Um, there's a functor in Haskell called list, takes each type to the type of lists they're in. And I claim we can do pretty much all of database theory with these two notions and maybe a little bit of natural transformations. But anyway, any questions on the category theory foundations before we get into the, the real stuff? All right, so here is the one slide overview of what categorical schemas and databases are. So up here on the top of the line, there's a directed labeled multigraph and two what are called path equations. Uh, below the line, there's a set of tables. And so the idea here is that above the line is the schema and below the line is the database. Or in category theoretic terms, we'd say up above the top is a presentation of a category where you have generating arrows and relations in the graph. And then like, you know, the, the equations that you want to hold like written below them. Um, and then the thing below the line would be the database. It would be a set valued functor from the category written above the line into the category of sets. And um, what that means concretely is that for each node in your category presentation, you have a table. And for each arrow in your category, each generating arrow in your category presentation, you have a column. And then the data in these columns has to be such that any path equations you wrote down are true. And so this says that if you take an employee, find who their manager is, and then find the department that that employee works in, that's the same as where the employee is working already. That says that every uh, manager works in the same department as their employees, for example. This is like a business rule that we can encode um, using a presentation of a category. Similarly, the one below it says that every secretary works in the same department that they're the secretary for. And if you come down here and look at this data, you'll find that like, uh, Where's the sec? Ah, there you go. SEC for secretary. Like, yeah, the CS secretary is uh, Al Aiken, who also works in CS. And so, anyway, that's that's the the basic idea in this approach is that you treat a database as a category, or more specifically, a finitely presented category, like a presentation directed labeled multigraph and equations, and then your database is just a set valued functor, uh, which people may call a co sheaf if they're familiar with that terminology. So anyway, I'll pause here for questions. This is, you know, everything builds on this observation that you can model schemas as categories and databases as set valued functors thereon. Um, I'm enlightening a little bit some technical distinctions about like how strings are different from employees in the sense you have like infinitely many strings, but not infinitely many employees. Um, the math that we have takes that into account. I'm gonna ignore it for this talk, but Anyway, questions, comments um, on this part here. Okay, uh, onward and upward, oops. So how would you write that in a computer system? So this is the CQL, uh, tool that I, I alluded to earlier that we can see later, like it has a textual input for this stuff. So if you wanted to write what you just saw on the screen, you just textually say, here are my entities. That's what people in database theory call their tables, employee department. You'd say, here are my foreign keys. These are the generating arrows between entities. Um, we distinguish the arrows that have type like string and int because the computer has to be careful about how it like deals with strings versus employees. Like it can't loop through all the strings like it can all the employees. And so like we, we separate these two types of edges. Um, but apart from that, it's the same as what you saw on the previous screen. And then here's those um, path equations that uh, you saw before. Um, yep, yeah. cool. So that should be just simple because it's a textual rendering of you know what we just saw. But um, anyway, let's start to get into the math and then we can, we can pause here for, for questions. So, um, how do you make all this formal? What I just said. So suppose you have your directed labeled multigraph and path equations S. So you have a presentation of a category that's called S. Then the category itself is written church brackets S like this. So people in the type theory lecture will have seen this notation before. It's like 
what we use to denote meaning. So anyway, um, what is this category that we build from the schema? So this is actually just a pre and quotient category construction. So this is this should be very obvious to people that have ever um, like built categories out of their presentation. So the objects of the category are the nodes in the presenting graph. And then for any two of those nodes slash objects, the morphisms in the category from X to Y, it's the set of paths that you can go through in the graph. So it's, no, it's not the edges anymore, it's paths that are the arrows. And more specifically, it's equivalence classes of paths. So it's paths from X to Y considered up to equivalence in those path equations that are written down, right? When you build an object from a presentation, like that's the way it works, right? You're, you take the, uh, the quotient by um, like the relations in your, your presentation of the algebraic object. So anyway, um, people sometimes call this, uh, like if you didn't have path equations, they might call it the free category on the graph. Um, when you do have equations running around, it's important to remember that computers cannot decide the word problem for categories. This means if you give me a presentation of a category and ask, does one, does it, does, does some equation, some path equation hold in it? Then in general, a computer may not be able to say yes or no. Um, this is called the word problem. And it's what makes all of this stuff that we're talking about today hard. Like in the same way, computational group theory is hard because like you, can't decide the word problem for groups. And so you need computer algebra systems to be really smart. When you do databases this way, you have the exact same problem that you're basically doing computer algebra. And so, you know, the, the system of two equations we saw earlier, you know, that one's decidable and easy, but you know, you can write down a Turing machine and like six equations and, you know, you can't like a computer can't figure out when those things are equivalent. And so anyway, a lot of the engineering has been like, how do you use this mathematical framework in practice without running into this problem. And so um, Conexus AI has spent like a lot of time building what are called automated theorem improvers um, to decide this as, in, insofar as it's possible. Anyway, a uh, bit of a digression, but it lets us define um, what schema mappings are. And then we'll see examples of how you can use these to move data around and how it's a like alternative to the relational model. Um, but anyway, if you have a morphism of category presentations, S going to T. That's the same thing as having a function from nodes of one to nodes of another, and from edges of one to paths in another. So it's it's edge to path rather than edge to edge, like you might expect. Um, and then in such a way that the equations of the source are preserved in the equations of the target. And so anyway, I, I, basically what I'm saying is if we think of schemas as categories, then maps between schemas are functors between those categories, you know, kind of obvious. And the way that you would write down a functor between finitely presented schemas is you would give a presentation of it, namely a mapping nodes to nodes and edges to paths in a way that preserves equations. So anyway, a lot, of, yeah, a lot of this is just category theory done with, with presentations. Um, but anyway, I'll, uh, I'll finish the material and pause for questions. So what else do we need to, to fully talk about this? So we've got um, what are schemas, the categories, what are schema mappings, their functors, um, what's an instance on some schema S? So I said before, it's just a set valued functor um, and that's restated here. So for each object in your category, you need a set. Um, that's gonna be the set of rows in your table. And for each morphism in your category, you need a function and you can read that off of like the tables that you saw before. You just follow the, the columns around um, as needed. And then finally, uh, yeah, natural transformations, data mappings, you know, those are the same thing in this framework. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll pause there. That was a lot to take in. And the point of it is mostly to be for this, this the examples of these things I'm going to show later to sort of make sense that I wanted to give like some mathematical rigor. Um, any questions here on the slide? So, can you hear me? Should I should I stand up? I can hear you. You're a little faint. Okay. Maybe, maybe come closer. Um, okay. So, just um, can you explain what you mean by the set of tables satisfying the path equivalences, please? I'm a little sure. confused. Right. So up here we have three nodes. And so down below, there are three tables, one for employees, 
one for departments, one for strings. And so the claim is that these tables are actually a functor from this graph up at the top into the category of sets. So to get to do that, you have to say like for each object, what, oops, sorry, wrong way. For each object, what is the set associated to it? And so if you come down here and look at the employee table, you can say that the set associated to it is the set of rows in this table, or you could even think just the set of IDs like 101, 102, 103. And then for every morphism in our category, so for every path through this graph, we have to give a function. So if somebody asks for like, what's the function works composed with secretary, we come down here um, and we, the function would be like 101 goes to Q10, 102 goes to X02. That's the works function. The secretary function is Q10 goes to 101, X02 goes to 102. We compose those two functions, and that would give us a mapping from employee IDs and the department IDs. And then there you go. We've we've read off the, the function corresponding to the morphism. So, um, yeah, any path through this graph, you, you can read off the tables below. And when you do so, like you, the table, the data needs to be such that these path equations actually hold in it, right? Like if you start with an employee, find their manager, and then find where they work, that needs to be the same department as if you start with that employee and just find where they work directly. So these are like data integrity constraints on the set valued functor written down below. Was that helpful? Yes, thank you. Sure. Are there questions? Uh, yeah. Let me get a bit closer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. I had a question about the more algorithmic side. So um, you, when, when, you're, when you're designing path equivalent, when you're, doing the, when you're solving the word problem in some arbitrary category, Presumably, yes. I, I'm assuming what you're doing is you're, um, you know, you're reducing everything to some first order equational theory, and then you're doing kind of standard ATP over that. Is that? Oh, yeah. In particular, this is already a standard first order theory. Like, right. you know, so, you can write write this and right and yeah, exactly. Okay, so so I mean, I mean, on the automated theorem proving side, is are you just using kind of standard Kluft Bendix type completion procedures, or is there something more fancy? Uh, Yes and no. So um, you have to be mindful of the fact that um, in the same way that group theory has its own special provers, so does category theory. So for example, you know, Newth Bendix completion as written operates on unary functions and it's great. But here everything is unary, right? There's and so you can use like a modified form of Newth Bendix that is monoidal to solve this one. And so like we have a theorem prover based on an algorithm from the late 80s that just, you know, eats these things for lunch when all you have are unary function symbols. Well, we have other theorems. Sorry? Oh, I can put that paper in, in the chat if you're interested. Yeah, like it's cited all throughout our papers. Um, right. But then... You know, there's more to it than that. I wish that would solve the whole problem, but something you're not seeing here in this talk, but it happens a lot in practice, is people have user-defined functions like addition, subtraction, that kind of thing. Now you're in binary function symbol land, and like now you do have to rely more on the like more standard Newth Bendix stuff. And so we actually work with like a professor who who does Newth Bendix completion, um, you know, on a special version that works well in practice on databases and then published on that. And so there's like, yes, it is the same stuff like Newth Bendix completion and whatnot, but it's specialized to categories, which gives you a lot more structure to work with than if you were just doing like arbitrary first order things. I see. Good I see. question. Okay. But so, so in particular, presumably therefore you wouldn't allow user, user defined functions that had, the, you know, that went beyond the expressive power of equation logic. Uh, yes and no. So recognizing that often people want that kind of thing, like if you want to axiomatize, hey, I've got a function that's an equivalence relation that you're going to need more than just equations, you're going to need like horn clauses. And so um, there is a way to go beyond equations here. There's two ways, actually, you can take, I call it the Evan Patterson approach and interpret this whole thing as what's called a relational O log, like treat each edge here as a relation. Or what we do in CQL is we can basically layer an additional logic on top of this one um, and then go from there. So if you needed additional constraints and stuff on top of this to do your job, like CQL has another logic for you that's more powerful. Let's you say express things like multi-way join decompositions. 
um, lets you axiomatize category theory itself. And so anyway, I have some slides about that. But yes, when we step out of the equational fragment, the story becomes much more sophisticated because like here, everything is in the presentation of the category theory. It's all like packaged together and everything just kind of works. When you, you start to go further, which you need to in practice, the story becomes more subtle and that's why they let us publish the papers. You know, the story didn't get more subtle there. You know, we'd be done on this screen here. So, you know, another big one being like, how do you deal with strings given there's infinitely many of them and there's like, that's different from your data. So that, that's another big place where the algorithmics um, has to adjust. Anyway, I'm starting to ramble, but was that helpful? No, that was very helpful. No, thank you. That's super interesting. Thanks. Sure. Okay, cool. Uh, other questions or shall we move on? All right, we'll move on. So um, let's give an example of a schema mapping so that we can see how you move data around using this framework and therefore see how it's a competitor to relational algebra. Um, so suppose we have a schema mapping from S to T. So suppose this is our S down in the lower left and this is our T in the lower right. Here's our mapping going from left to right. It's an assignment of nodes to nodes, edges to paths, uh, such as as follows. So integers go to integers, strings go to strings. It's actually a condition that's required to deal with like the infinitude of integers and strings. You know, if you want to convert between them, you insert like a coercion function or whatnot. Anyway, this mapping, it, it takes N1 and sends it to N and sends N2 into N. So these two tables here get squished. Um, the edge F goes to the zero area path. So F gets mapped to the identity on N and then name, age, and salary, these edges get mapped like to their corresponding counterparts. So anyway, I'll, I'll pause here for a minute. This is very similar to what you see like in industry with ETL problems. Like somebody has some database that looks like what's on the left. They want to load it into the structure on the right. And ideally they'd like assurance that that will work correctly without having to run the data and then check to see if they did it right. And so, you know, by insisting that this F is actually a functor, we can guarantee that. Right. Like if you tried to map, you know, name to salary, something would go wrong. Or if you tried to, you know, map this edge F to age, something would go wrong. And so anyway, there the uh you know, functorality here like gives you some static guarantees. Um and right. So I'm gonna go through an example of like what those are, but first let's define um the operations we're, we're doing like mathematically, then, then we'll see the, the definition or the examples. So like, anyway, keep, keep this in, in your head is like the, you know, examples will be on this particular functor um, and, and keep it in your head is the F in this diagram. So it, what this is saying is that mathematically, if you have a functor like what you saw before between two schemas and you have a database on the target schema of, of that functor. So another functor, into set. So the functor goes from schema S to schema T, and then the database goes from T into set. Like you can just compose these two functors to get another functor, like I composed with F. And now that goes from S into set. And so that's a S value database. And so like literally composition itself gives you a way to move data along a functor. Like if you have some database T arrow set, and you have some functor S arrow T, now you've also got a database S arrow set just through composition or as logicians would call it model reduction. Um, but anyway, the, the point here is that the way these definitions work like so much in category theory is that you define one thing easily like this here, you know, it's kind of intuitively a little weird to understand because like you're moving data in the opposite direction of the functor and you know, that kind of thing. But then the other ways you can move data around and like what's in my background and in my shirt and stuff, they're defined as the adjoints to this operation here of composition with a functor. And so in particular, there's two other ways to move data. Oops, sorry. Uh, there's this pi operation and the sigma operation. And so whereas delta takes instances on T and converts some instances on S, these adjoints, they convert instances on S and push them into T. And so the actual relationship between these things is, is written out in this adjunction language. It's basically a statement that like the mappings between something you do with delta are in one to one correspondence with something you can do for pi. 
and similarly with with sigma the mappings or the, yeah th there's a deep relationship between all the you know this operation that's easy and then these other operations that category theory says exist and so what i'm going to do next is actually show examples of these using the schema mapping from the previous slide um, so that everyone can get their head around these examples and then um, we can we can pause at that point so um, anyway, any questions here on the, the theory part before we see examples of what's on the screen? Okay. So ho hopefully this will make things clear. Um, this is the schema mapping you saw earlier with one modification. The arrow from N1 to N2 has been removed, and we're going to add it back later. But the reason for removing it right now is to, to see how these operations work like in a more extremal case that's a bit unnatural. And then we'll see that when you add the edge back to this schema, like everything sort of becomes more natural. So anyway, um, suppose we have this setup. We have a mapping, a functor from the presentation of the category at left to the presentation category at right. So these are kind of impoverished categories. There's no relations in them. They're just basically graphs. Um, but the point here is that you can start with an instance on the right. So, you know, I said that your instances are one table per node. So there's just N here for our table. I mean, there's string and int. I'm, I'm not writing those. Um, and so here, here you go. Here's three tables. You got Alice, Bob, and Sue. And I claim that we can move data in the opposite direction of the mapping just by like composition. And so what does that look like? Well, um, how do you populate the data for N1? Well, you start at N1, you look at where F sent it, and that says it sent it to N, and send, then you go into your table for N, and you like use the columns that are there. And so like Alice gets transferred over to N1, salary gets transferred to N1, age gets transferred to N2, and you split up your tables by composing with this functor. And like it's a little bit jarring sometimes to see that the functor goes in the opposite direction of the tables, but if you've ever programmed like in SQL, you know, same phenomenon is going on there with your select from where logic and, you know, people get tripped up the same way. So anyway, I'll pause here. This is um, the easy of the three operations that you get out in this method. Um, questions, comments? All right. What do the other ones look like? Um, the right adjoint to that operation, um, it takes products. So if you have a, a database on st starting on the left and you want to convert it into the right, well, how could you do that? Um, the math says, well, the IDs in N should consist of a product of all of the things that map to it. And so three times three is nine, and here's nine rows in your database. Now, I, I'm being a little fast and loose, but like, what are the IDs that we assign to these things? Like, it turns out that it, it doesn't matter that since we're in category theory and working up to isomorphism, like A, B, C, D, E is as good as, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 for their ID names. But anyway, same functor. Now it's moving in a different direction, left to right, and it has a, a product like semantics. Um, any questions here? All right, and then the last one, uh, sigma. What does that look like? So as an adjoint to delta, it also moves from left to right. And so here's the same database that we had before, Alice, Bob, and Sue. Um, when you do sigma, what it's saying is that the rows in your target should be not a product, but a co-product of the things that map into it. And so you see that we have Alice, Bob, and Sue in 20, 20, and 30 in here, um, but we put in, what are called labeled null, um, and this is going to take some explanation, for these missing values over here. And so, um, like, those familiar with SQL probably recognize, like, the word null. Um, you know, what you're, we're trying to indicate here is, like, new data that didn't occur in the original table. Like, these are freely generated, if you will, null one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. Um, but anyway, yeah, the reason you need nulls in relational database theory terms would be that you can union tables that are not quote unquote compatible, right? N1 didn't have an age. 
um, but N2 did. And so when you do this sigma construction, like you're going to end up with nulls like this. And often these nulls end up getting squished out and like, um, you know, merged away and that kind of thing when you have path equations around. But anyway, um, I'll pause here. So you've got your, your delta, which does the obvious thing, your pi, which is an adjoint, which does products, and then your sigma, which is the other adjoint, which does coproducts. And then here in a minute, we'll put this edge back in this schema and see uh, what happens. But anyway, questions here. All right. Um, so why do all this and not just use Brian, database theory? Sorry, that's a question. Oh, yes. Okay. It was, just, it was just a clarification. Which of the two adjoints did product and which one did co-product? Ah, right. Uh, pi is the product and sigma is the co-product. In database theory, they'd call that an outer union, outer because it adds null. But yeah, we tried to match the notation from like type theory and stuff where they have a similar adjunction and use pi for the product and, and sigma for the co-product. Good question. Are there others? Okay. So um, before we put that edge back in and, and see this again on another schema, like why use these operations at all? And, you know, the reason is that because they come from category theory, they give you all this pleasant stuff like by construction. So for example, because sigma and delta are defined as adjoint, that means there's a monad, which has a itself a unit in it. And what that means is that we can do what's called round tripping or give the lineage for data. So um, if you start with N1 and 2 like this, and you do your sigma like we just saw, you get your null values introduced. But then if you do your delta back onto the schema where you started with, what you'll find is that there's a unique embedding of where you started into where you ended up, this little eta. This is the unit of the adjunction. And so, like, yeah, these operations, they don't undo each other. That's not what adjoints do. But they do let you relate, like, where you start to where you end up in a unique way. And so, like, in practice, like, we actually use this map to quantify information change through real-world schema mapping projects. And anyway, here you can see, like, yeah, there's a unique natural transformation from the top to the bottom that, you know, preserves the, the data in the, um, you know, the source data. So anyway, there's, there's a lot of things like that where you, you get for free from category theory things that you have to work for um, in other data models. Um, I'll pause there. Uh, any, any quick questions on that one? Let's go ahead and put that edge back in and then see what happens. So if you change this scenario so that your schema now has an edge from N1 to N2, then you find something pretty cool happens, which is that your delta operation, it splits up your data correctly while remembering, like using that foreign key, how the splitting up happens. So whereas before we just populated name and salary, now we're also populating F and it points in the N2, and in particular, it points like to the age associated with that person. So this would be called a join, a lossless join decomposition in database theory. And we didn't change our delta, like we just changed the schema that we're on. And so like the intuition here is it's actually schema design, like more so than like data motion design, which is your lever for how you implement ETL. In the reverse direction, if you have this edge in between them, and it's been populated like this, you know, in a way from Delta, for example, then both Pi and Sigma, they do the same thing just in different ways. Like Pi would product these things together and then filter them to do a join. And here you go. Sigma would union these things together and then do like a squishing row merge operation, the result of which is a join. And so they both do the same things in this case, the Pi and the Sigma. And it's because there's this edge in between uh, the two tables. And so Anyway, we, we like to tell people that like you can't go wrong when you use this methodology because like yeah, all the action is in your schema design, which like hopefully, you know, people we work with know more about that than like how sigma, delta, and pi are defined. So anyway, um, I'll pause here on this screen. Any questions on how these things work um, when you have a an edge here from n one to n two? All 
Okay. Then in the uh, 15 minutes remaining, I'm going to try to give a brief overview of all the other awesome things that happen uh, with this software and then may or may not show the software itself. So um, one of the more interesting things that happens is that, um, and what I, I mean, is going to be the like, you know, we're witnessing the mathematical reality of the universe or something like SQL queries themselves can be understood using like the stuff that you just saw. So like pairs of functors, either a, a delta and a pi or a delta and a, a sigma, when you think of them at the same time, it turns out that like the syntax you need to write them down is like relational algebra. Like so it's, you know, looks just like SQL. So here um, is syntax in our tool that, you know, you have selects, you have froms, there's no where clauses here because it's a like degenerate example. But anyway, um, yeah, one of the neat things is that you can use SQL syntax to specify all the categorical constructions you just saw. And this is really what allows us to take this thing into like commerce and, and sell it to people and whatnot. Like without that property, there's not enough pro programmers in the world that know how to write schema mappings. But if you can like program this thing using SQL code, um, then you open up a much broader like audience. And so, you know, same story repeats with these new um, like what we call queries. These are profunctors or bimodules in the math. Um, you know, if you have a query populating one from the other, this is in a reverse direction to what you just saw. Um, then as before, there's two ways to move data. We call them evaluation and co-evaluation, but like the same, you know, same story applies with round tripping and everything else. So um, anyway, with that, um, like I can give the demo here, like we, we you know, support this thing um, commercially. I guess I'll just, uh, let's see if I can move this back to my other screen. Uh, there we go. So you can, hopefully people still see, uh, see my screen and um, like I'm just showing basically a, a text editor here. I'll be very brief. Like here's our employee schema written down as text. In this example, we created a cumulative age column just to illustrate like how this can work with user defined functions. Like here's a little presentation of an instance. You can push the button and like view your schema as a graph. You can view your instance like as a table, you know, to see all the theorem improving going on. If you go in here and just um, like delete a bunch of information, um, you know, the tool will do theorem improving and compute the initial model nonetheless and it'll do it symbolically right so like here are a bunch of unknown names and here are some unknown ages but like the cumulative age like it's you know written symbolically in terms of these unknowns and so anyway this stuff all works but um like yeah don't want to spend too much time on the demo so um i'll just mention a few more you know interesting things about this formalism and then um uh, stop for questions so um, you know, I mentioned user-defined functions before. Somebody mentioned automated theorem improving, and they all work smoothly together. And so, like we, you know, we wrote path equations before using like a stylized syntax. If you write them in first-order logic, you know, it, it looks very much similar, right? For all employees, E, like the manager that E has, and you know, it's the same. So, like. The advantage of this formalism is when you have user defined functions running around, like they just go in your math and you don't have to do much to, to deal with them, which is different than in database theory. Um, there's significant connections to relational algebra. So we have a version of the software that when it's possible will emit SQL code to implement these operations. Um, you know, not always possible, but we wrote a paper that characterizes exactly when it is, and it has to do with technical conditions about like surjectivity of mappings and things being discrete op vibrations and, and stuff like that. So anyway, SQL interop is all there. Uh, graph interop is there too. So people who know about the growth and deconstruction or the category of elements probably recognize that you can take tables that look like this, turn them into a graph that looks like up at the top. That graph is also a category. And so like it's very easy to turn data into schema and, and vice versa um, in this framework. Um, somebody asked about 
richer data integrity constraints than you know what goes beyond equational. Like suppose you wanted to say that something was a key, like if two departments have the same name, then they're the same department. Like you can't write that that conditional logic just using equations. Um, and so you need a more expressive logic. And there's a very natural logic that's used in database theory and in category theory. It's, it's logic of existential horn clauses. These are also called lifting problems. They're also called um, regular logic. I know, poor choice of name. Uh, but anyway, the, the basic idea is that like you can you can use that logic to to say when an instance like satisfies some additional constraints. And so, like I won't walk through the details here, but suffice it to say that you can say things like this table is a join of two others that you couldn't say just with the equational logic in a presentation of a category. Um, anyway, so David Spivak wrote a great paper on this, database queries via lifting problems, and then we have a survey paper, algebraic model management, that talks about some of this. Um, another extension, like putting products and co-products directly in the schema. So there you, you kind of lose delta sigma pi, but you gain modeling capability. This is actually an example from something we did uh, with Uber. Um, you know, they needed a, a formalism that like can store their users and trips and writers and stuff. And so like you can see this idea of a structured schema with like a product table that has projections like first and second. And you know, here's a dual, you might imagine a co-product table with injections like in right and in left. So anyway, that what you're seeing on the screen here, it's kind of our rendition of something called um, an attribute sketch. And that, that's a technical term by Bob Rosebrug. But if you like what you see on the screen right now, then search for sketches in category theory and uh, you'll find a lot. So anyway, I think I'll stop there. There, there is a further way to like do data integration with this technology, not just move data from one point to another, but use the machinery um, of push outs to do it. And you can integrate schemas this way and you can integrate data this way. Um, it's basically a generalization of, of what you, you saw before and I, I won't get into the details. So. Anyway, um, to conclude, so what you've seen, it's a new algebraic approach to, to databases based on categories. You know, there's more to it. You can layer non-equational stuff on top and all that, but the, the core is um, this new algebraic notion. You get these delta sigma pi um, data migration functors. Um, I didn't talk about it today, but people can look through the slides. There's a, a connection between the simply type lambda calculus and everything you saw today. Like you can provide a model of the simply type lambda calculus in database schemas, for example. Um, it, great, and then I showed the tool a little. So anyway, I guess the final message is we're looking for collaborators. So like, you know, we have our own in-house mathematicians proving theorems day to day. Like, you know, that could be you. We have, you know, people want to contribute to the, open source code base, like, you know, that would be great. We, we still maintain a collaboration with like LinkedIn, for example, on some of this stuff. And um, yeah, anyway, I, I hope this got you interested enough to, to reach out further. Um, I will stop there and hope you're all not dying of the heat. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Ryan. Questions, comments? Everything? Uh, so I have a, a question. Uh, more, come closer. Uh, yeah, I have a question more of a programmer than a mathematician, so that it'll be directed in that way. But I've used most forms of SQL and non-SQL um, databases that exist, and, I, and I, I think maybe I'm not sure if this is implied from what you said. So correct me if I'm wrong. But can you have a similar like NoSQL or nested JSON, like an arbitrary um, level of depth in the kind of nesting of the underlying data set? And I think you kind of basically keep inspecting at different different levels. Is that am I correctly understanding that? Ah, right. So the traditional approach here is that when you have nested data, say JSON, you know, how do we ingest JSON? Like we shred it. Like you you have to flatten it, right? Like there's nothing innately nested about this definition of schema. And so um, right, like if we encounter a nested relational schema or a JSON data set, then you, you shred that into flat tables using like traditional techniques from theory. Like there's a whole body of work about how to take a nested structure, turn it into a flat one, how to take a nested query, turn it into a flat one and, and that kind of thing. And, and that's what we follow. Like we take the shredding approach. 
and it you know it works well enough for us to import and export JSON and XML and um, other nested ones. I think those are the big two. But yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, there's another body of work on categorical databases um, on the nested relational calculus. So like that's, and there's a formal duality between that and this that we wrote in a, a, a paper, I'll put it in the chat. Um, you know, if you, this, you can think of this approach as bringing like user-defined functions to queries, whereas the usual approach like brings queries to programming languages. And so anyway, there, you, you ask the deep question and, and here everything is flat, but there's a relationship to a nested data model that is well worked out and like shredding works well enough to go back and forth. Um, anyway, did that answer your question? Sort of, yeah. So concretely, like say I had a, a table or, you know, stru structure that was like all professors, right? And then I had various associated um, fields and et cetera. Then would it be possible to, after that was already instantiated, then basically create the superset of all teachers or something like that? And then basically continually evolve the database to have, I don't know, say greater levels of this case, kind of something. Oh, yeah. I mean, often what we see is you, you start with your database that you import from somewhere and then you write, you know, dozens of functors to say how you want to transform it into some other thing. And it's, you know, the, the whole pipeline is, is what you go through. So, you know, we'll, yeah, we'll see dozens of, of functors that make up an example. Um, you know, in what you said, I, I didn't get the impression that any of it was like innately hierarchical. You know, from an intuitive point of view, if you had a nested structure that was like parents and children, you just break that out into two tables and, you, and you'd have a, in fact, let's see if, uh, oh, here we go, nested relational shredder. So if you've got like a nested relational schema that has like, I, you know, I have a set of people and they have children, which are a set that you know, in, in the, the nested model, it looks like this, right, with nested relations. And in, in the flat model, like it looks like this, where we, we've had to introduce like extra foreign keys to hook the tables together. But that is like what represents the nesting structure, like in the flat way that the category theory requires. So anyway, may, maybe that um, helps the, you know, if I can, there we go. Yeah, maybe that'll... Kind of a great question, I guess, about the sort of utility or who you've seen, maybe from a business side, if you've seen adopted. I know you mentioned like a big Stanford chemistry lab or something. Like, is there specific object types that this is lending itself extremely well towards? Right. So it's typically when there are, um, when assurance is required because of the functoriality guarantees. So, you know, if you're building, say, a dating website where you're trying to match men and women against their favorite books and you go build an ETL process, you, know, you can get it wrong. Whereas in this tool, like if you make a mistake, like I, I just wrote a, I forgot a join condition in my ETL process here. Like the tool stops you before you can even run it. And so like the answer to your question, like where we see the most traction with this isn't like replacing SQL straight up but it's in those circumstances where you have to get your ETL processes right, say because they're moving like 10 petabytes of data each time that you push the button, or like if people will die if you get the data transference wrong, like that happens at the oil company we work with, like, you know, explosions can happen. And so I'd say it's like high assurance ETL um, where this shows the most value. Good question though. Did my presentation go? Ah, there it is. Other questions? questions. All right. I think no more questions uh, on our end. Uh, Ryan, this was a wonderful contribution. Honestly, it was a really nice counterpoint to a lot of the topics that we had. So thank you very much again. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. So let's see. Owen is here with us. Um, apologies for the delay. Um, we are going to take about three, four minutes to change room. Uh, the air conditioning just started working again here locally, so some people might have decided to follow from elsewhere in the campus because this was unbearable about an hour ago. Um, so bear with us and we'll be right back to restart in a minute. All right, sounds good. <laughs>